another edition of the Magpie Circle, and we're joined by a Notts County Championship winner. Not been too many of those in the past couple of decades, but Ricky Ravenhill is one of them. Uh, two and a half years at Notts, a member of that never-to-be-forgotten Munto era. Ricky, a very warm welcome to the Magpie Circle. Thank you very much for having me. Deli delighted to have you on board. Lots of things to go through, but... Um, this will be a first. I want to start by reading out a little bit of prose, a little bit of journalism that you produce for the independent newspaper, and it will kind of set us off on, on, on the way. Um, so you, got, you had an article published, National Newspaper, and this is how you started it. Um, I feel like Jack and Ori or something now, <laughs> those of a certain age. But um, It was my first day at Notts County. I looked across the dressing room, and saw a player I knew well, too well, Neil Bishop. Playing against him with previous clubs, I'd not just kicked, tussled and argued with him, I'd even broken his jaw in an aerial challenge. It wasn't deliberate, but he might not see it that way. Elsewhere in the dressing room, there were two or three players looking at me up and down in a not so friendly manner, knowing that I'd been signed to potentially take their place in the team and knew it could be a good few weeks on the periphery, trying to pick the right time and right words to join in the banter before these barriers would come down. Those awkward situations are ten a penny in the professional game, but especially in lower league football, as the transfer merry-go-round means nearly every seasoned player will know someone at their new club, have links with someone, or, as in my case at Notts County, will have to bury hatchets with enemies. Very good. Um, 48 games later, you've got a League Two Championship medal. But let's just pick up. So what were your thoughts then in the dressing room that day? It's as I said, really. You go into a new club and um, it's one of those where everyone's weighing each other up and there's quite a few new signings come on board. And you, if you don't know them personally, you know of them nine times out of ten. So it is one of those where you're weighing each other up and... It doesn't take long. It, it doesn't take long to obviously have a chat and um, get get on board with each other. But it, it is that sort of feeling. It's that first day at school sort of feeling where you you're having a look round and weighing each other up and uh, looking at your new teammates and who's going to be your competition, etc. So pretty daunting, but it's it's one we thrive on and one which we all know is part of the game. So it's, it's great. There was a quite slightly more complicated dynamic. Uh, we had Neil Bishop on a few weeks ago, and of course he laughs about it. Um, but you, as you've said, you actually had, he'd sustained quite a nasty challenge uh, in a collision with you in a game in the not too distant past, correct? Correct, yeah. Um, obviously, it was 100%, there was no malice in it. It wasn't anything like that. But I think the way me and Bish play, listen, we're always, if we're not on the same team, we're always going to, come up against each other at loggerheads. We're both very com combative and competitive. Um, and it was just one of those situations. I, I didn't know him at the time, didn't know anything of him, but we'd, we'd probably been tussling all game and have it, having a little go. And I think the ball st dropped sort of mid-zone. Um, he went down with his head. Obviously, I went with my foot and I caught him in the, in the face. Um, and like I said, I don't think there was a lot of it at the time, but it came out afterwards that he broke his jaw. He didn't go, he didn't stay down or go off at the time. He carried on and it just came out afterwards. And um, it was one of them things that, like I said, I didn't know him, so I, I couldn't really apologise or get in touch or anything. And I think even after that, a few years later, when he were at Barnet, we, we had another tussle. And it, obviously, it, it is football, like I said. And if the way we play in the middle of the pitch against each other, there, there was other people in similar mould that you had battles with. And it was just one of those things. But then when you sat there and you, you're becoming teammates, then it's, it is, it's one of those things. But we, listen, we were absolutely fine. And like I said, he knew it wasn't malice. And, that, and we, we got on great. And we, we formed a great partnership together that season. That's, did, was That's that something sure. that cropped up in conversation very early on when you went in at Knotts between the two of you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we 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 had a laugh about it. We cleared the air and everything like that, and just just moved on from it. It was just one of those things. And like I said, he he knew how it was. I did, and there, there was no malice. There was no um, no actors there. A little funny story though. I don't know if you remember the game um, Bournemouth. I don't know what year it had been. Bournemouth at home. 
Yes. He he did get his own back um, unintentionally. <laughs> well, he tells me not, but we're both in the middle of the pitch on the same uh, team, and we got sandwiched, and he he caught me flush in the face with his boot, and uh, I ended up spending the night in hospital myself, getting some. I've got some stitches to show for it as well, and got knocked out. So. Really? He, um, unintentional. Unintentional. It's probably karma. It come back around. It got me. He got. He caught me with his studs. I used to have a picture of the still shot where his, his boot was in my face. So uh, we'll call it one all and move on. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I didn't know that bit. Very good. Uh, yeah. But- when Bish was telling us the story, because I mean, he's as hard as nails, isn't he? And yeah. it, he was saying it, it ruined it after, after, after he sustained the broken joy, it ruined his night out because he'd gone home to his mum and dad <laughs> and he was trying, you know, he was trying to get, get his clobber on and go out and said he just felt absolutely terrible with my joy. So he had to go down the hospital. But I, interestingly, he played the game. He didn't come off, did he? He played the game. He carried on. Yeah, yeah. To be fair to him, I'm surprised he didn't just, just go out knowing Bish. He's mad as a box of frogs anyway. Like, I, I don't think that would have stopped him going out, having a broken jaw. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. So, quite a, a historic season, Monto and Knotts. Um, how, how did, because you were at Darlington, so how did you end up coming to Knotts then? What, 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 was, the, what was the sequence of events? Because you wouldn't have so, known much about Sven at that point, or, or would you? Uh, I, knew, I knew absolutely nothing about any of the takeover. I knew nothing at all. Um, so, I just the season before at Darlington, I just had a, a, a bad time in terms of the club went into administration. Um, we were in a really good position. Uh, the club was invested and got us into, I think we, were, we went in the playoffs the year before and missed out. The year, the, the year it happened, we were about second or third with games in hand. And the club went into administration and the chairman pulled this, his money out. Was this the ex-safe cracker? And then someone got charged with trying to set the stadium on fire or something or other? Was that the year? Yeah, that yeah there was the also. Or? I think that was a different guy before. The guy that came in and put some money in, then decided he didn't want to do it, and uh, right. something to do with the state. There were some things to do with the stadium and rights and ownership, but he, he'd had enough. He pulled his money, and we went into administration. So I had six months of not getting paid, and we carried on playing. We we gave it a go, um, but the, the team ultimately fizzled out. Um, and come the end of that season. I got a phone call from uh, Chaz, um, Charlie McPartland, um, wanted to meet me. Um, so I was, I was up for it, obviously, after the six months I'd just had. Um, I was ready. I think I had another year on my contract, but I think because of the situation, it, it got, it was, I was allowed to waive it. Um, so I went and met them, uh, had a great chat, and obviously signed, came to the ground and signed the contract, not knowing. He told me that we were going to have a go, that he, he found, he'd got a good some players lined up that he fancied it. He fancied we could have a real good go, but there was no talk of at that point that to the scales of, of what went off just a few months after that, really. I didn't know anything as I signed. I think I actually was one of the first to sign that summer, if I remember rightly. Um, obviously it all happened quite after Bish came, Ben came um, and whoever else, Hughes, they all followed. But I think I was one of the first to sort of put pen to paper on, on the deal so early on in the summer. I have to say, recruitment was excellent that summer. You know, not historically have struggled a bit from where they used to be with recruitment mm. over many years. But the recruitment that summer, even before the big Monto money came in, was very good. You know, because you'd already got yeah. two promotions under your belt with Doncaster. We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, you know, you're one of them players that, you know, 99% of the games, you'll be there, you'll be playing. So recruitment was very good. Um, at what point did it kind of transfer from putting together a solid team to Sven, Munto? What, when did you hear about it? Did you think, oh, that can't be true? Or what, 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 how did it sort of suddenly ratchet up? I can't remember the actual point of where it, where it actually happened, you know, where, where the turning point. But obviously there was that point where things started to get said rumours of people who were going to sign started going from the calibre and the, the started going up and then you start sat there thinking well I'm I'm pretty sure he's going to be earning good money I don't know where this money's coming from and why would he leave I think do you know what I think Carl Hawley came from Preston and at the time in the championship people like that Johnny Jackson coming from yes. Charlton and you start thinking whoa these guys are you know these are coming from a high calibre of 
people. So um, not that they're not welcomed into the team, of course they are, but you start asking yourself, where are we going with this? And then, like you say, it just escalated from, and then you see Sven turn up and then you see Sol Campbell turn up and it's like, it's like you've got to pinch yourself. It's a little bit of a, a little bit surreal, really, from from signing a few months early and not knowing anything what, how this was going to pan out. Um, Husey coming in was clearly a, a, a key component. Mm. Um, but just take me back to the morning when presumably you've heard a bit about Sven, you've heard about the Monto billions. Yeah. But I'm guessing until you see Sven walk through that dressing room door, you're still a bit... Mm. What was it like when you saw Sven for the first time? Like I said, the whole thing was surreal because it, it, it was League Two. It was, uh, it, it, things like that shouldn't really happen, should they? You shouldn't see the guy that you've been watching take your national team into tournaments, then rocking up at Meadow Lane about to be part of what, what we were going to do. So it, it was like pinch yourself stuff. And it was like, you did really have to take a step back and say, is this real? Is this really happening? But... At the time, you went with it, and, and I didn't, until maybe a few months after that, or as things developed, when the money side of it was getting questioned, at first, you, you just believe it. When you first hear it, oh, okay, someone's chosen us because we're the oldest club, and there's history behind it, so they're choosing us to put the money into to try and get us into the Premier League, and, and you, you believe it, and you go with it, and you, you just feel honoured to be part of it, I presume, initially, until until bit by bit it starts to unravel and you, and you do start asking a few questions and uh, you're not sure where it's going. First game, Bradford, Sven, um, Husey gets a hat-trick, um, jobs are good. And at that point, you must have thought we really could be onto something special, yeah? I think, I think right from the pre-season that year, right from the, the moment we assembled that team, the Chaz, before, before everything else happened, there was a good feel. There was a really good feel about the group, um, about what we could achieve. Um, and then to go in the first game and, and perform like we did and, and destroy a team like Bradford, who probably were one of the favourites come the start of the season. It's a big club at that level. That's, the, that's when everyone said, well, hang on a minute here, there's... We've, we've got a real chance. There's something really good happening here. There's, we've got, not only have we got a good squad, there's more investment coming. We've got people like Sven involved. And, and everyone did really believe then that something special is going to happen, I think. Um, how good a team was that? You'd, you'd got a championship under your belt with Doncaster a few years earlier. Um, Do how, good a group of, how good a group of players was it, you know? Right up there for me. Um, like you said, recruitment's massive in football. I've learned that over the years. And you've got to get the right people in um, that have got the right attitude, that want to learn, want to develop, and want to do it together. So, I mean, you, the four promotions I've managed to have, lucky enough to have in my career, I look back and I think that the ingredient is the dressing room and the people. Um, I've been in teams that have probably had more quality, better individuals, but but as a group, to to all be striving and achieving the same thing and have the camaraderie and everyone's fighting for each other, that's when that's the same ingredient that all the teams have had that I've had success with, and and that was no different to that that year at Notts County. Great set of lads, everyone knew their own jobs, everyone knew what they were doing. Were, you felt like every time you walked out there, everyone was fighting for each other and wanted the same thing. And you had each other's backs, and and that goes a long, long way in football. And that's we definitely had that that year at Notts County. We had we had a, the right blend. We had we had the, the grit, the determination. We had the quality and the assists with Waskar, Davis, people like that. You've got someone who can put the ball in the back of the net, and and I just think the the, the blend and everything we had, and it all comes back to getting the right people in the recruitment. And uh, you've got to take your hat off to Chaz for that before before everything else came together, I think. Um, second, third game, I think it was at Macclesfield, if I remember right, he was publicly unveiled, I can't remember if he played not. Casper Schmeichel. So that was kind of another signal of intent, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, again, huge. Probably not for himself at that point, because I don't think he'd achieved too much no. individually. As in, I think he, we helped kickstart his career as much as anything else, but... Obviously, the name um, coming from Man City, 
again, like you said, everyone knew he was going to be a good keeper. So for us, again, to get somebody like that with his stature, with his the credibility that comes with him was another, like you said, another statement at that level of what we're trying to do. Well, when we had Leon as a guest, he was the very first guest on our series, actually, about six months ago. And uh, he tells, uh, tells in his own way how Casper um, uh, just needed taking down a peg or two. Not that he was a bad lad, but, you know, young no. lad. Senior I know. Approach. It's interesting the way you chose your words there as well, saying we helped him. Definitely, because I'll, I'll reach I'll back exactly. I know where Hughes is coming from. Um, Casper's unbelievable lad, and he he, joined, he got on with on board of what we were trying to do very very quickly. But you did get a little bit of he did need just reining in and hang on. This is a level to lead two now, and you're not showboating. You're not a Man City superstar just yet, <laughs> um, or Leicester super. So you. He had to he had to adjust to our level and adjust and buy into what we were doing and get on board with the whole team spirit camaraderie. This we're in it together sort of thing. And to be fair to him, he did that very very quickly and he he was a massive part of what we did that season. Um, you had the cup run. I think wouldn't Wigan? I seem to remember. I sat next to Sven that night. Um, how, how was it on the training ground? Lee and others have told us that Sven would be there every day with Tord but yeah. they would keep a respectful distance away and Charlie would be taking training. So did, did Sven get actively involved with the players or was it just little words here and there? It, it, it was just little words. They're exactly right. He, he kept his distance. He never forced himself into anything. Didn't, he didn't really have any interest in the, taking any training or he just oversaw everything um, and made sure there. And fair play, he was... Thick snow, freezing cold, he'd be there wrapped up. He, he wouldn't miss a training session. He, he was there at every session, but he didn't, like you said, he didn't impose himself too much. He just stayed in the background. I think, I think the only pressure came was Chaz feeling him, his eyes on him and feeling the pressure of, is something going to change? Is someone else coming in? Is, do you know what I mean? I think he felt the pressure in a different way. It wasn't that he was... He was taking over and pushing him aside in any way because he never did that at all. He was he was very respectful and just kept his distance and watched and 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 watched from afar really. Um, I've known Sven a little bit from my time at Leicester, and um, he's very unlike you know a global Galactico football manager. Everyone will say who meets him, he's like he's like your uncle, you know. Yeah. I mean, was it? With, you know, I don't know if he had many chats with you, but yeah. were these sort of some searing bits of insightful advice? Or was it just general little points thing? Oh, right, okay. You know, he, he, he... And that's exactly what it was. It was um, not what you'd expect at all from, like you said, you see him he's manage these top clubs and he's managed the country. And But yeah, he was very, very mild mannered, just the odd little comment here and there. And, he, you had more conversation with him, just a, an everyday conversation, and or like he wanted to take you out or look after you in that way. It wasn't so much football chat. He wouldn't throw himself with points as football wise. He left that to the management and the staff, and he was more just there as a figure to to support you and be there and have a chat and and be interested in your life, so to speak. So it, it was really really nice guy. Bish told a good story um, how he went out and he bumped into Sven in a, in a Chinese restaurant in the centre of town. And Sven kept sending over a bottle of champagne, £150 <laughs> bottle of red wine. Clearly, clearly that £150 bottle of red wine is lost on Bish, as we know. Um, <laughs> did, did, did he take you all out together? Did you get any hospitality from him at any point? Or Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've had odd nights. We've had a few odd nights. Like I said, we had a good group. So we... we got out a little bit together when we could and we all tried to, we either went out for food or went out for drinks and yeah, we bumped into him. We've seen him out a few times and, and he, he couldn't do enough for you. Like you said, he, he would want to buy you a drink. He would want to look after you make sure you were, you were looked after. So that, that's the kind of guy he was, but he, he, everywhere he went, obviously you can understand he, he, he probably had a crowd around him. He had a lot of people following him and there's a lot of attention around him. So it was difficult for him, but um, yeah, he could never do enough for you. Never, never do enough. So, you mentioned Charlie, and I think it's a, it's it's quite an interesting point that I think Charlie himself, as you said, felt the pressure, felt the pressure, felt it was he was always going to be moved on at some point. There wasn't a lot of latitude with results. Yeah. 
And I, I got that's I got how that. it transpired. I think it was a televised game with Torquay, wasn't it? Two nil up. Yeah. And it ended up being two all. And yeah. I think I think Charlie was um, released after that after that game short uh, shortly. All the players Which, I've spoke to said how well they respected Charlie for what he'd built up. All of them, their view was that the club would have got promotion with Charlie at the helm. 100%, I agree with that. And I think in any other circumstance, in any other way, there's no way he would have left the football club with us in the position we were in, um, in, in, in any other situation other than the fact that someday come on board and there was a massive investment and I, I don't I, I want to say it but I think I I feel like his his days were numbered right from the start mm. I think unless we'd have been top of the league uh, all the way through and they, they physically couldn't do it I think there was always going to come a point where they made the change unfortunately and I, and I in that respect I feel for him um because he didn't leave the club for anything he'd done wrong. He just left because of the circumstances, unfortunately. I'd agree with that. I, th I think he almost needed, from the first game, to record the kind of runner form that Steve Cottrell did in the second half of the season. Yeah, definitely. I would agree with that, yeah. And I felt like he, he knew that as well. I felt like from the minute it all happened, I felt like he felt under pressure. And I think he felt that, if he wasn't top of the league, he'd be in trouble. And the pressure was so much more than it would have been under normal circumstances. And I think that, I think he suffered with that. And I think he, he felt that himself. And that came across in a little bit, that he felt that pressure, which is a shame because a club that sat, what were we, fifth? Were we fourth or fifth with games in hand? Yeah. Should, yeah. A man, yeah. I don't think a man should feel that pressure that early in the season in that position. Um, had the cup run, Games in hand, um, hands back uh, uh, ca came and went fairly quickly. Round about this time, there were the question marks, weren't there, o over the finances, over, the, over whether the money was real. Interesting what you said earlier. You had been through that process at Darlington that had ultimately had ended up in administration. Yeah. Did you see similar warning signs or did you think actually we'll be all right or do you think, you know, this might get a bit iffy? It was a completely different circumstance to the Darlington situation because it wasn't like there wasn't the hype and the big names and everything involved with it. So it was on a smaller scale and that all just happened. You didn't have time to think about that. It just happened. Whereas this sort of built the momentum and you felt it coming. So, um, yeah, there were, it was worrying. Um, the more people that started to talk about it and the jungle, the jungle drums were beating in the changing room and somebody would say something and, it, it, I remember it came to a point. Uh, there was we all had a meeting in the changing rooms, and there was Husey, led by Husey, Akinbai. Uh, I think Sol was still there at the time, and and we demanded some answers from Peter Tremblin. Um, we, we actually went to him. We demanded some answers, and he he produced this letter, um, which had a bank guarantee of five million or whatever it was. Don't worry, that the money's going to be there. We've got this guarantee. So I don't know if I should be saying this, but uh, but we no, I mean Peter's got on record as saying he had that letter, but I I the story you're telling, and please continue. I'd not heard it in this detail before. Yeah, so we sat there and we got we were in the changing rooms. We we raised issues, we raised concerns, we were reassured on numerous occasions that I've got this guarantee, uh, the money's coming, it's real, it's this, it's that. So ultimately, it's. It is worrying. We do talk about it. It went round the dressing room. People voiced the concerns. But we had no reason to, to do anything because we were getting paid. Yeah. We carried on. Um, we still had a great group of lads. That never changed. Uh, we had no reason not to carry on and give it our all. So um, nothing changed from us personally. We all just we got our head down. We carried on. And... Um, but ultimately, there were times of downtime where people would voice their concerns. That, that's inevitable when you're hearing what you're hearing and you're seeing what you're seeing and then you see soul come and go and etc. You, you're going to question things. You're going to worry. 
but ultimately we, we had a job to do and we carried on and the lads were extremely professional, which I go back to the point, the right group of lads. I think if maybe if you'd have had some different characters in that group, they might have dropped tools, they might have jacked it, they might not fancied it till they knew exactly what was happening and the season could have been a write-off, but we had the right mentality, we had the right group that wanted to carry on, wanted to achieve something, no matter what, we wanted to go, we knew we had something special and we wanted to see the season out, we wanted to finish what we started, so until we had any other reason not to, we just carried on. You mentioned Sol, so Sol had the one game, uh, yeah. more come away, more come away. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> not, not great, and I think the following Monday or something, he's, he's gone in to see Peter Tremblay, uh, enough's for me. Did he share anything with the lads, or did he, was no. it a case that he was quiet about it, respectful, but maybe read the script before some of the others? Yeah, I think that's exactly the case. He wasn't, he, he kept himself to himself, he kept his thoughts to himself, so he never came in talking about anything like that. We never heard anything from him. Obviously, the first we knew, he'd gone in and he'd seen him, and then he was gone within a matter of days, so... Obviously, it left us wondering what's going on, but he never, he never cut, said anything or let anything leak. Whatever he heard or knew, he, he kept that to himself, and that was never disclosed with any of us. So I can only imagine, listen, I don't know what people earn and what people do, but I can only imagine he came in on a big promise. He wouldn't have come for any other reason. He must have been getting on some serious money, and, and for them to fund that over what maybe we might have been earning was probably harder to hide maybe, or he perhaps wasn't getting his money. So he, he must have seen or heard something that enough for him to, to get out when he did, I would imagine. So Munto's starting to unravel. Um, I, think, I think the chronology was Peter took on board the club himself, bought it for you know a pound, uh, and then has to kind of start looking around for funding with, with, with Sven. Um, what's the attitude of the players at this point? I don't think it changed. All I, I just remember us being focused on what we wanted to achieve. Um, like I said, of course it's, it's worrying. And of course you don't know where it's going to end or how it's going to end. But like I said, I could just re reiterate, until we've got any reason to believe any different, we had a job to do and we were getting paid to do a job and, and us as professionals wanted to see it through. So we carried on, we trained hard, we carried on turning out for games and, and we just carried on. And just on, on that as well, to show the kind of guy Sven was, he, he could have walked away at any point when he yep. knew what was happening. So I've got the utmost respect that he, he helped us find the new investment. He, he used his influence and his power to get the club into a safe place before he departed. So I know speaking from people I've spoke to and myself, we've the utmost respect. And would we have finished that season? Would it have gone into administration? Would we have got the investment without him? Who knows? Um, but he made sure the club was sorted and in, a, in an all right place before he moved on. So um, I've got a lot of time and respect for, for him doing that as well. To allow us to go on and win the league. Did you hear about the um, Rome, Roberto Mancini story? Uh, not sure. Which, what's that one? <laughs> okay, so when I did a book, I'll send you one big book, massive book. Use it as a doorstop. And I spoke to Sven, um, and we were chatting. And it was before the Euro 2016, and I was with England in France somewhere. I got hold of a number for him in Spain via Ian Walker, the ex Spurs goalkeeper who I know. And so I ring him up. And he's, he's like chatting like a bird. And then he goes, oh, Paul, yeah, I, I, t I tell you the, the Mancini story. Do you know that one? I said, no. And um, apparently Sven had approached Roberto Mancini to be manager. Oh, you know, would you be interested in coming in on the project? And Mancini is like really keen because he's out of work and Sven was a bit like his mentor. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and so he told Russell King. And so they had a meeting at the Dorchester, obviously only the best. So you've got big portly yeah. Russell, Russell King. Um, you've got Sven and Roberto Mancini flies into the Dorchester. And they have this meeting. Um, I think it was just after Charlie had gone. And um, Mancini says, yeah, I want the job. It's all agreed and everything. And so Mancini is desperate. 
and and spend oh yeah I, I, i'll speak to you a little bit more some more detail but so so it's more or less done you know mancini's desperate to come and sven said to me i've got a couple of reservations at this point i wasn't quite sure and so i said i said to roberto just leave it a little bit leave it don't don't rush in there might be a bit and apparently roberto for about 10 days after that is chasing sven and i want the job come on let get me in and and and, and sven's kind of said nah, i'm not sure i don't want you to come so we'd obviously got reservations a little bit earlier yeah. but to your point he was kind of like holding him off a little bit um but yeah i mean that was the world that was That's incredible <laughs> can you imagine how different it may have been if mancini had turned up and um, <laughs> managed <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, and it's a nice little link. I don't think he'd have got any more points than Steve Cottrell, do you? <laughs> Definitely not. No, <laughs> Definitely, not. Um, Definitely not. We should not. say at this point, while we're doing this live, Steve has been taken ill with COVID and has been in hospital in Bristol for three or four days now. And um, we wish him all the very, very, very best with his recovery. Um, I think actually you, you, you mentioned earlier you'd had you'd had the COVID over Christmas as well, so you're yeah. you're okay now. Um, yeah, yeah, fully recovered now. But it, it did hit me hard. Yeah, um, you hear stories and stuff about some people get symptoms, some people don't. But yeah, it hit me quite hard. I, luckily, I wasn't hospitalised or anything. The breathing was fine, but like a severe, very very severe flu type thing that took several weeks to to shake and get over. So yeah, it's. It's definitely active and live, and it's, it's out there, unfortunately. All our best wishes to Steve. So, yeah, Steve definitely. Cottrell comes in. Um, again, I know Steve. Um, I think the word that we all use to describe Steve is intense. And I think he kind of left you in no, under no illusions, did he? And please tell the story, but I think the gist is, he said, I'm not coming here to finish third or fourth. You lot are going to win the title, yeah? Or should be winning the title. Yeah, they pretty much told it how it was. But you know what? I think for what happened and where we were at, it, it was exactly what we needed at that time to get us in that, over that line over the last period. And um, like you said, again, I heard stories before he came in. This guy is chocolate. He'd eat himself if he can. He, he's quite... But I'll tell you what, he was... Um, he did a fantastic job. He was a top, he was a top bloke to work for. A uh, very good manager, and he, he did exactly what he needed to do to to get the best out of us lot and, on that final stretch. Remarkable run of results, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we but we knew we could do that because we've shown it all season in glimpses. Maybe a little bit inconsistent and dropping points, but right from that first game at Bradford, we've, we've shown what we were capable of. We showed what strengths we had as a team, and um, I think it, it all just came together at that point and we just went on an unbelievable run and winning's, winning's a great habit to be in as we all know it's it's you feel invincible um, you go out there every week believing you're going to win no one's going to take any points off you and it pretty much proved that way we just went from strength to strength other than a, a slight little bit did we lose one game was it one game one game at Port that? Vale wasn't it under Cox yeah one game which Listen, you take that form. It's a little blip, and we wish we could have gone the whole season, the whole period. But that's fantastic form, and uh, anyone who, any team that produces that form, deserves to be champions. Because Rochdale had had a little niggle, hadn't they? I think about you know false money and all the rest of it, and they came. It was a midweek night game, wasn't it? Which I remember being a real sort of blood and thunder affair. Yeah, I remember that. I was up against my. Um, to teammate to be later down the line, Gary Jones, and I remember us having a good old uh, tussle that night. Yeah, and um, like you said, it was it was a great great battle and a great game. And but that that's that's what you've got to do, and that's what you've got to get through to be to be champions. And uh, whether it's a cold Tuesday night or whether it's a bright sunny first game of the season against Bradford, it's you've got to turn up and you've got to perform and you've got to to, to do what you've got to do. So is it. So there was promotion, and then I think I'm right in saying the championship was clinched at what, what presumably was a bit of an emotional evening for you because it was at Darlington, wasn't it? It was, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Um, it, it was a great evening, it was great. But it's, the way the whole stadium with no fans yeah. wasn't ideal because it always feels a little bit like, a, as good as the stadium is, it feels a little bit like a reserve game, doesn't it? And a, 
uh, well, that we can relate nowadays is there's no fans in there. But um, at the I time, think it, were relegated that, or were, were relegated at that in that season as well, weren't they? I think uh, they were down there. I can't remember if they went down or not. Was that the year they went out of the league? Have they not been back since? Is that? I think that might have been because. If you remember, the stadium wasn't being cleaned, and it was, and it was one of those very rare occasions when I think there were actually more away fans there yeah. than the home fans. Very yeah. rare, you know, without any bands on home. There, it was actually one of those rare nights where there were actually more Notts fans having yeah. travelled all the way up there than there were home fans. Because I think at that point, Darlington had basically gone as a club. I think they'd, yeah. I'm pretty sure they went down. I'm pretty sure that's down. pretty pretty much how I remember it, but. All I know is that we got back in the changing rooms and we, we recovered the walls for them with champagne. That's all, that, that's all we were needs to know. And it was, it, listen, winning a championship, winning a championship, you enjoy the moments and no matter where you are or what you are, you enjoy it because it, they don't come along that often and uh, you've got to make sure that, that you celebrate and enjoy what you've achieved. At that point, what age would you have been in your career roughly? Uh, I would have probably been late 20s. I want to say maybe yeah. So, so, so at that point, at that point, um, you've got League Two with Knots, and you'd also had back-to-back -back promotion. Well, a promotion back into the league with Doncaster, and a League Two title with Doncaster. So that, yeah. that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, how would you compare the Knots team? And you spoke about some of the comparison with team spirit. Um, with that Doncaster side, because I'm presuming back to back, that must have been pretty special and had some yeah. very strong characters and good players too. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's hard. It's hard to compare when you look back. But the only thing I come back to is is the changing room and is the camaraderie and is the togetherness and you feel it. Unless you've been there, you, you feel it and you you just feel that there's something special in a group when you get it when you get the blend right and you get the right characters. And we had that in abundance back then. And we went up from, uh, we had some good young players at the time at Doncaster. Um, we had the likes of, um, obviously, Coppinge just starting out his career. Michael McIndoe, Paul Green, myself. We were all at that time, when, I, when I've done it with Doncaster, we were early 20s, young. So it was... It felt a little bit different because I was so young. I was learning and I was I was I was coming along. Whereas probably I was more one of the senior ones um, when it was with Knots and I, I helping some of the other players along and we're in it together. So it's it's different. But the only thing I can compare is is the is the togetherness and the team spirit that that we had in both groups. So obviously Doncaster's my my hometown. So yeah. that was special for me. Um, People ask me a lot of times what what was my the best team I was in, what was the best promotion I had, and it is so hard to pick between the Doncaster, Notts County, and Bradford. I'm forgetting Bradford as well, and the season that the few seasons I had there. So there were both, uh, all three, really really good times in my career, and um, hard to choose between. I ask all the lads, and we've had a few on now, uh, Mike Edwards as well. Um, I think one of the, mo the most seminal moments um, in Notts' more recent history was having had that very, very talented group of players and stormed League Two and clearly had the right manager that was the right fit for Notts yeah. um, that Steve left. Yeah. And depending who you speak to, some would say, well, he was never going to stay. Uh, he wanted too much, this, that and the other. And then there are others, and I spoke to several players, who said, yeah, he would have stayed. What, what, what was your take on that? Well, I had a, I had a long conversation with him over the phone um, while it was all happening. I remember him ringing me in the summer and he wanted to stay. He wanted to stay. He wanted to, unless he was lying to me. But no, he wouldn't I do thought, I, I think I know him. I thought I got to know him well enough and we got on really well. And he wanted to stay. He was talking to me about who he'd identified. He talked about what he wanted to do. Um, but he wanted to do it properly and he wanted to make sure we did it right. Not on, he didn't want to follow up with a half cut season and, and not back up what we'd achieved the year before. So inevitably, no matter how good our squad was, you need to add to it. You yeah. need to keep developing. You need to evolve with the time. So he needed a few more. And 
I, I don't know the ins and outs, but I, I can only guess he didn't get the reassurances of the backing he wanted under his terms to stay, because he definitely wanted to stay. Very interesting. And, you know, Ray has gone on public record since saying, you know, it cost him up to 20 million running and buying Notts County. Well, you know, of that 20, he's probably lost about 15 million of it there and then by not giving Steve Cottrell another half million or whatever it was on the budget that was needed. Yeah. yeah? And Listen, it, when it's your money and you're a chairman, it must be hard to see past that and to see how that might change by spending the extra, spending to accumulate, as they say. But it must be hard to do that when it's your own money. But in hindsight, we can all see that now, exactly what you just said. If he'd have just gone with it and, and backed him and trusted him with what we had and what he could have brought in, then the story may have been so different over the next few years. But it wasn't to be. And uh, it is what it is, obviously. You can't change history now. Or it's just one of those things. It would have been nice to see how far we could have gone with that group. What then happened really was not kind of defaulted to what has happened for many years, high churn of players, high, sparked ultimately by high churn of managers. So Craig literally had about 10, 12 games, if that. Uh, mm. You had Paul Ince. Um, you ended up with Mar uh, Martin Allen, I think would have been that following season, wouldn't it? Yeah. So what was that season like? Because you were playing week in, week out again. I think it was something like 48 yeah. games in the first season you played, 42 this coming season. So what was this one like? Uh, completely different, if I'm being honest. Um, under no fault of, I think, Craig Short came in um, and, and he was trying to get his own philosophies in there. Every manager has their own and it just never quite clicked early enough for him. He came in, it was his first job in England. It was always going to be a tough task to follow what had happened. And I feel, I think it was a little bit harsh that he didn't get longer to, to make it work. But I think you get judged on because we were so successful. And then we'd go from not winning every week. It, you're under a bit more pressure. And unfortunately, you see it happen to managers. They go in as the first job into a quite a big, big job. And if it doesn't work out, he, he's never really gone back in anywhere else since. So he, I think he was a little bit unfortunate. He, he had a good backroom staff in with him, the ones that knew the club. So it helped. He had Dave Kevin, obviously Tommy, Drapes, the, the, the good people who've been at the club and know the club were there to help him. Um, but unfortunately, he just didn't get the time he needed. And I, I'm a big believer he, he should have been given a bit longer to, to make things better at the club. I think it's fair to say Paul Ince split opinion in the dressing room, yeah? Hughesy, yeah. Lee, Lee makes so, bones, didn't really get on. Bish said he was fine with Paul. Um, from the outside, it would appear, certainly whatever the characteristics of the success of the previous season were by now largely dissipating, yeah? Yeah. Um, I would definitely say that. And by the time Paul came in, Listen, he's, he's an absolute legend for what he's done. Um, I'm a Man United fan. I, I love everything he's done. and He's a fantastic player, but there's no two ways about it. The whole atmosphere changed around the place. Um, his, his ways didn't suit the group and wasn't conducive to the camaraderie we'd built over the, over the years. It, it just had a different feel about the place. And... Um, it, Sometimes you'd feel like he was looking down on you, like you weren't good enough. He'd there was times we'd get left in the changing rooms with no answers um, for for long periods of times after games. We'd we'd be sat there and saying, "Do shall we get changed? Shall we go?" And it was just little things like that. It just the whole place, the atmosphere changed under him, unfortunately. And um, like I said, with a different group, he might have suited a different group. I just don't think the blend was there. For what we had, I don't think the changes that he made and the way he went about it suited that group, and it hence it, it never it never sort of kicked on for him. I think it not was quite a working. I think it's a working class club, and I think it was a, a a working class group of players that you had, and kind of Paul is a bit more of a Rolls Royce, isn't he? Where he's been in football and all the rest of it. Yeah, definitely, and. 
I can understand that he's probably trained and and watched people and been involved in a lot higher standard sort of sessions and things like that. So maybe he found it hard to to watch us that, that were maybe frustrating him that we, we weren't on that level for whatever reason. But but that that then came across to us and the way he looked at us and thought about us, we felt it. So you want to be inspired by your manager. You want him to believe in you. And, and, and we just didn't really get that. And me speaking personally, there might be other players that, that have a different view, but it just didn't work for me. Just, just the blend wasn't right for what he wanted and the way he went about it for what the group of lads we had and what we were about over the last the year, the success before that. But... There were two very special games, weren't there, against Manchester City? Yeah, like yeah. The, well, never, never take them away. You can never yeah. take their memories away. And like, like you said, the, the amount of downs you go through in football, you've got to enjoy the, the special times, whether it be the promotions, whether it be those big games that, that you've earned the right to go and play in. And that was definitely another one of them. And what a, what a fantastic uh, Saturday afternoon down at Meadow Lane that was or was it Saturday I think or Sunday I think it was Sunday because uh, it was Sunday, live on yeah, some, Man City yeah. was spending all the money weren't they there were yeah. all the players and fair play they put the full team out didn't they for that game at Meadow Lane the full team they was did. out there they did and I'd be lying if I didn't say I was stood in the tunnel looking up at them all because they're all humongous <laughs> giants as well that slightly intimidated but um, and a bit in awe but Again, it's it's eleven v eleven, and we went out there and we proved that it doesn't matter how much people are on. It's eleven v eleven, a one-off game, anything can happen, and, and we more than earned the right to go and get that replay. Um, we weren't lucky in any way. We didn't fluke it. We went out and matched them and gave them a real good, real good game. Who were you up against in midfield then? Who who, who were you coming up against? Uh, so I remember the second game was Vieira because I've got his shirt. That's yeah. what I enjoy. I've got Vieira's shirt, so but I don't. I don't did he play? In the, yeah, no, I think he did, did play in the I first game. I think the only game. one that didn't play in the first game was Tevez, and he played in the second game yeah. and got trick. <laughs> yeah, I remember Gareth Barry played in both. Um, I remember in midfield. I remember that. Um, I remember Silva came on in the first game. He didn't start. David Silva come on. Um, the likes of him, obviously. Jeco scored the goal. Yeah. Uh, People like that. So yeah, they had a they had a very strong team out, and they um, they went for it. I mean, you, you made the point. You know, this wasn't like because in an average Premier League game, Manchester City don't have less than eighty percent possession. But it was it it was a good cup time. You had plenty of the ball, and so yeah. second half, the corners come in. Bish has headed it in one nil. It's on, isn't it? At that point, it is on. It is, and you believe in, and you. you you believe you're going to be the cup upset. You're going to be the one, the team that get the headlines, and you're going to go on and enjoy it. But yeah, obviously, it wasn't to be in the end. But listen, we were we were so proud of what we achieved anyway. To go to to match a team like that um, of superstars and, and unlucky not to go through is is a fantastic achievement. Yeah, I always remember the moment because Jeco couldn't score. If you remember, and yeah, he, yeah, and and I think it was young Christian Pierce, wasn't it? He's just switched off a little bit and jacko has got a yard on him. And if he yeah. had that yard, he wouldn't have scored. And now, you know, we've got, you know, ifs, buts and maybes, isn't it? Exactly. And listen, if we help kick on his career a little bit, Jekko, then that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll, we'll take a bit of credit for that as well. Because I think he, he came to life a bit after that. So That's we right. helped kick, that, that we'll turned, kick for him. That turned it for him. So yeah. main, I was going to say Main Road, crikey. Um, whatever it was called then, the Etihad, Etihad. Or the Stadium or whatever. Uh, City of Manchester Stadium. Um, and if I remember, they put the full team out again. Tevez played. Uh, yeah. If I'm right, it was nil-nil. And you remember Carl Hawley put some sort of like cross-come shot that looped over Joe Hart and hit the yeah. post at nil-nil? Yeah, yeah, I remember that clearly, yeah. And again, who knows, if that had gone in, that might have given us something to hang on to and change the game, but it, it never, and listen, it, it turned out to be what it was. Yes. I think, I think if I remember rightly, I, I got put on, I was looking at the team sheet in the changing room and the set pieces, and they had that many big players. I think, I think the manager thought that Vieira would be one on the edge of the box and he wouldn't be one of the main targets, so I think I got put on him. 
And I think he went and scored two goals when I was marking him from uh, in the box. But and I got took off him after that. So, uh, <laughs> but then you look round and you think, well, who else would I mark? Because they were they were they had such a big team, and um, yeah, it was one of those things. It, he went and scored a few goals, and but their class told in the end, and yeah. and they, they they really did show us what they were about. So there's no, we just enjoyed it for what it was, really, I suppose. They were great diversions in what was, you know, a bit up, uphill and down Dale, uh, more yeah. down Dale at this point. So, yeah. like you say, Paul probably never really took to Knotts. Knotts never really took to Paul. Um, so then there's another managerial change. Uh, and the one and only Martin Allen comes in. So yeah. I suspect, uh, I know Martin quite well, and I do like him and Knotts fans like him. Uh, I, I think character is certainly one of the things. And I think he told me where he locked you all in a room and got you to write things on pieces of paper. Yeah, yeah. I remember that well, yeah. yeah. What did yeah. you write on your piece of paper? Oh, God, do you know what? I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember. I just remember thinking, what the heck's going on here? But <laughs> there, there was so many, so many stories. And he is one of a kind. But again, it was what the club needed because... Yeah. He brought back the camaraderie, the team spirit. He, he was more of a, a people's person and a, a team guy. And it's what we needed at the time again. Uh, so I think that was a good appointment at a good time for the club. And listen, I'm saying this on the back of he phased me out. He ultimately, I'll ask you about that the, in a minute. Yeah, go on. Ultimately, yeah, ultimately, he was the guy that phased me out and um, obviously decided, brought other players in and decided it was time for me to, to move on. But... Even off the back of that, I've got a lot of respect for him and I enjoyed my time with him. Um, and uh, like I said, I learned a lot from him and, and there's no hard feelings whatsoever. It was one of those things. You're never going to you're never gonna be everybody's cup of tea or they might just think it's time for a change at a club. So it was one of those things. But even off the back of that, I've got, like I said, I, I spoke to him for a long time after. Still have the odd text. We don't talk regularly, but... We'll drop the odd text here and there and still keep in touch with each other and have a mutual respect for, for what we did. And, and the job was achieved, wasn't it? Because it was a tough ask to turn that ship around in that yeah. space of time. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's not easy to come in and, and need the results and need to get to a place where the club's going to be safe and, and secure and, and back in a good place. So he came in. And like I said, he lifted people with his energy. He lifted people with his what he was about and brought a good feel back to the place, which, which was very much needed. And, and people enjoy training again and enjoy being around the ground. So it, it always helps. We all, like I said, I've come back to it a number of times within this conversation. I think the group and the team, the spirit alive in the changing rooms is, is key to any success because that's what I've learned over the years and that's, what I'll always moving forward with anything I do. That's that's what I'll base everything on. So job gets done, stay up, start another season, uh, and clearly one fixture above all else uh, sticks out uh, in that first two or three months, and that is of course Juventus. Um, did you know anything about not having supplied black and white striped shirts to Juventus or anything like that, or was it all a massive no. bolt out of the blue for you? No, I knew nothing about it. Just one day someone told me the story, um, how they had no kit, borrowed our kit, kept the colours, and, and then we've been invited over. So even at that point, you're thinking, oh, we've been invited over. All right, that's nice. That's a lovely... <laughs> yeah, I don't think you could ever imagine how that, that short little visit would have gone. It was just uh, incredible. Um, from the moment we, we flew in private jets and... We Juventus sent showed... over their little jet, didn't they, to fly you all over? Yeah. Yeah, we, we had police chauffeurs everywhere we went, the police escort. You felt like it was like, like being like some incredible superstar that was, we were just, we were just League One footballers. Um, and then for, for them few days, we just felt like superstars, the way we were treated and looked after and the whole atmosphere of the game and the calibre of people that were surrounding us. It was, it was phenomenal. It was an unbelievable experience to be a part of and something that, a lot of people don't get that opportunity to do at our level. So very grateful for the opportunity that we got and, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. It was one thing to be going to Juventus. I don't think I was obviously out there, but 
I don't think anyone actually realised the spectacle it was going to be. You know, because, you know, uh, is it going to be sold out? Well, they say they've sold out, but half of them won't turn up. And, and then you turn up and, like, they've commissioned, as I found out, the um, Winter Olympics people. So Juventus, presumably on what they, they saved on paying knots, uh, they, it cost them about 150 grand to put on that pre-match entertainment show. It was done by the same company that did the Turin Winter Olympics. You know, wow. it special, wasn't it? All the lights and the oh. zebras and the... Oh. Well, like, like you said, I don't think anyone knew what to expect. Even when we were there, we got <laughs> told there'd be some sort of something happening before the game because we got sat in the stands. But I don't think until the lights went out and all the, the, the craziness, the, the, like you said, all these, everything went off. I don't think we actually realised ourselves what a big deal it was going to be. And like you said, to have a full house and... Um, the atmosphere that was created it was it was incredible and 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 of course Juventus had all the players out as well didn't they yeah yeah um they put a full team out they respected what it was as much as we did and like I said for us as league ones last league two footballers to have even been invited there to watch the game let alone play and play against them types of players and was uh, something that was that were very special so who, who were you up against in the middle of the park that night then? Uh, Vidal. He's one that sticks to mind. Um, I remember playing against him. Obviously, Del Piero was sort of dropping in little pockets and stuff. And I've got a few, obviously, I've got pictures and memories of things with, with these types of players. So um, always nice to look back on and, and just drop in with your mates now and again. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Uh, for, for, forgive me if I've got this wrong, and forgive me for bringing it up. According to my lad, did you give the penalty away? I did, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I did. But there we go. The first ever penalty to be given away in that stadium. That's something that I, that's never going to leave me, is it? But I think it's a little bit harsh if you look back as well. I'm sure, the ball just sort of popped up and it just flicked off my arm or something like that before I cleared it. So, but, but, yeah, but, unfortunate. It was in goal. It was, it, it, someone saved Buffon. the penalty and the rebound went in. Was it Rob Birch in goal? Oh, yeah, for, for us, yeah. Rob yeah, Birch, and, yeah, and didn't he save the penalty and they, and they put the rebound in or something? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Was it Luca Tony? Yeah, it? that's it. That's Luca it. Tony, the left footed guy, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, well, as soon as I saw him save it, I thought, oh, yes, he saved me. But then he <laughs> just put it in anyway. And, oh, well, and, never mind. It happens, doesn't it? It happens. Yeah. And who else? Who else would be but uh, Lee Hughes could be the first Englishman to score? In it had to be, didn't it? It had to be, didn't it? It just had to be. Um, what a guy, what a character and what a player. And for him to go there and, and achieve that for him, I, I was pleased for him as well because he deserved it. Now, there was a bit of a bum fight, wasn't there, about the shirts? So, yeah. Uh, oh! This is pretty rare, and I had to put, pull a, all a few favours in to get one of these, because the actual, this is <laughs> Bukanich. It was making his debut. Cost him about 20 million euros that night. And wow. they put these little badges on, don't Juventus. Yep. Yeah, just, you know, it's an authentic shirt. Um, but Juventus had kind of put a three-line whip on all the players, hadn't they, to tell them, you can't swap shirts with them Notts County players because we want them for our museum. Yeah. Yeah. So take take up the story because you you didn't get too much change on the pitch out of Mr. Vidal and you no. got less off it, didn't you? Yeah, I probably kicked him a few times <laughs> earlier in the game, so it probably didn't help. But then, yeah, in my in our broken uh, language barrier, I was clearly indicating that can can I have your shirt after the game, and um, it was it was quite uh, abrupt really in, in his response, saying no, no, not not swapping though, but at the time I didn't realise, but I think they had been told that they, they weren't allowed. I just thought it would have been ignorant and rude, but it, I think it turned out that he wasn't allowed. And so we came off a bit deflated thinking, oh, chance of a lifetime to, to, get, a, to get a bit of a memorabilia. But um, luckily we got back to the hotel that evening and uh, Martin now, Allen... Before you get back there, yeah, except Lee Hughes, it would storm through... Yeah. And into the home dressing oh. room and accosted um, Perlo and said, I'm having your shirt, here's me pen, give it me and sign. And Perlo, ah, the shaven head of <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, you're not, you're, not, 
You're not saying no to Hughesy though, are you? You're not saying no to him. None of us have got the balls to do that. I don't think he could ever do that. But so the rest of you have gone home, gone back to the home. Fair, I, I think Bish got um, Del Piero's because they were cap. They got they arranged that before the game, so I think right. he, so he was sorted. But the rest of you are thinking, ruddy hell, yeah, yeah. But Martin came to the rescue, yeah. Yeah, well, he, he went missing in the hotel. We got some food on the way when we got back there, and then he, he just he went missing for a while. He, he turned up with a pile of shirts in his hand. He's dropped them on the floor, and he said, "Look, I managed. I've worked hard. I've managed to I'll persuade him to let me." He said, "It's a great opportunity for you lot. I'll let you have some shirts." I think he had like seven, maybe eight, right. and obviously that wasn't in, that wasn't enough to go around. So. We, I can't remember how we decided, to be fair. I don't know if it was the ones who started that got preference or whether we drew it out of a hat. I can't remember, but I just remember I was lucky enough to to get a shirt. Um, I got the left back on the day, which, do you know what? I can't even think of his name now as we speak, but I've I've got it framed up in my, in the room. So I've, I've made sure that that's on pride of place. Yeah, and um, I'm hoping you've kept your, hope, your shirt we wore because we wore because the story was we should have wore the white shirt, shouldn't we? Some special kit. And the rest yeah. didn't allow us to wear them because it was a colour clash. So we had yeah. to wear the blue, light and dark blue. And I think we got one of those um, gold patches that we've just seen stuck on top of the shirt. So I'm hoping you've got that. Yeah. I have, yeah. I've got that. I've got them all safe. I've, I'm slowly now. I always said when my career was finished, I'd, um, I've got a massive pile of shirts that I've gathered over the years and I'm starting to get through them and frame them and uh, I've got a, I'm having a room done where I can get my, my main ones I'm not going to get them all out but I'm uh, I'm going to get a select few out in the room so at least they're there on the show that's good because you'll frame your shirts you'll never frame a paycheck will you you won't frame a paycheck from 25 years exactly but shirts are memory so that's good it is um so you've, you've alluded to this that Martin kind of phased you out or whatever i think gavin marne was one of the players that come in we had jeff hughes on the left side who did well for the club so yeah. how did it come to an end at knots for you um there's a few few instances that stick in my mind i, I always remember coming back pre-season uh, obviously i had the number eight shirt for two years i always remember coming back in the pre-season of my last year and my shirt had changed. I think I was given the number 15 shirt, which is a massive indicator straight off. Um, and let's see, it, it, it's like it's a warning sign, it's there, it's on the cards. But I, let's say I got my head down, I carried on. I was in and out, I played a bit. I think his son came in, Charlie came in. Yes. Um, I, I, was, I know he was wanting to push him a little bit as well. And like you said, Gavin Martin come in. Um, and I was in and out. And it... He was always really nice about it. He was always to a point where he'd explain everything, he'd say what his thoughts were, he'd be honest with me. So I, I respected that. And I always remember I got knocked out in one game as well. I, I remember going down, I got knocked out, and he came and saw me in the hospital. Um, he said he had a lot of nice things to say, but. He, again, he, he delayed bringing me back. He, he slowed the process. And, and all the signs were there that, obviously, I just wasn't going to fit in what he was trying to do. So, But even even then, he, he said, even though I'm not going to play you, he said, I value your experience and your knowledge. So I remember being sat at a couple of games up in the stands with a headset on, and he had me reporting down from what I saw up in the stands, even when I wasn't involved in the games. While I was still at the club, because he was used, he wanted to get my experience, my knowledge, without it using me on the pitch. So he, he found another role, so to speak, I suppose. While I, while I was still there, getting paid, he, he was he was using me in different ways and asking my opinion on things. So I, I appreciated that, and I appreciated the fact that the way he went about everything. So it was just one of those things. And then in the end, obviously, there was a call from Bradford, which I think we all just knew it was it was the right time. Yeah. Um, Sometimes you can stay too long and too much, a good thing, as good as it was, you just know when it's time to move on and, and, and start something new. And that we all just knew that was the right time and, and it was an easy, done deal and amicable in all respects. And it worked well for you, didn't you? Because you got another promotion and you had some good years at Bradford. I had some unbelievable, again, another fantastic club that I went there when... Obviously, they took me in because they were struggling. They were near the bottom of League Two at the time. 
in, de- in a not a great position. Uh, we, we saw that league year out and survived. And then I was made captain. Um, and again, it was, it was very identical to the start of the next year. It was very identical to the year I joined Knox. And you saw people arriving and you saw calibre of people that you thought, like I mentioned earlier, Gary Jones, um, people like that. Um, uh, else, who else came to the club at that time? Uh, I can't think off the top of my head, but there was a few that came in and you start to think again, hang on a minute, this, we've got something good. And, and that again transpired. Oh, Gary Thompson we had, Kyle Reid, people like that came, coming into the club. Um, and, and it just took off again. It was an, another one that we just, that year was unbelievable again. Um, we got to a Carling Cup final, which is unheard of. A League Two club getting to a Carling, a major cup final. Um, it was a, unbelievable experience and one the media that surrounded that again and the attention that that brought to the club and the money that made for the club was out of this world and it it, it was just another one of those years it was in a different way to the to the year with knots and the, the, the success with Doncaster but equally as equally as good in different ways now you've clearly looked after yourself um and you've and you, you te- you're still registered, but I mean, you, you've been playing long into your late 30s, possibly not dissimilar to Bish. I think you've managed to maybe just outlast him a bit. Both <laughs> of you carried on playing for a long time, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And it's, if it's in you, then it, you don't want to let it go. And you, everyone I speak to says you play as long as you can and you enjoy it for as long as you can because you're a long time retired. So I think you look at the frame of us both, me and Bish, um, there's, we don't carry a lot of weight. Um, we've got energy to burn, so it helps in that respect. We were lucky enough not to get any career-ending injuries, yeah. um, so so you just go as long as your body can possibly go. And I'm just about I'm registered at the moment at Miklova, but now I've become a, assistant manager there. I'm 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 sort of hit a point where I'm I'm accepting that I don't think I'm gonna really play anymore. So 40 years old last weekend and. Probably time to, probably time to call it a day. I think because Mickleover have done very well, haven't they? Former Derby chairman Don Amot had a few ex-league players there, yeah. um, and you've all. I mean, we're we're speaking here when there are real doubts now about whether the national league can continue, um, yeah. with all the loans and grants debacle. Um, mm. You've already basically chances are had your season suspended, and 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 you've been badly hit because you were what runaway leaders. Yeah, we had a fantastic start. And and like I've said before, I, taking both myself and the manager, who's a close friend of mine who I've known for years, Tom McGrath, we both, we've got philosophy, a way we want to play, and we recruited, we, we really identified who we wanted to bring into the club and what types of characters we wanted to work with and coachable players, players that wanted to learn and want to develop and want to work hard. And we got it right this summer and we hit the ground running and we got 10 games in and, 22 points, which was 2.2 points a game, which gets you a definite promotion. And it's a very unfortunate, listen, it is what it is, and COVID is where we're at, and we can't do anything about it. But it's, it's unfortunate that a club of Michelover's size and stature probably had the best season they've had in a long time, and it's probably not going to end, and we're not going to get rewarded with, with hopefully where we would have ended. Did I see somewhere you've done a bit of uh, junior coaching at Don, uh, Donny, Donny Rovers as well? No. I don't anymore. Um, right. I've, I've, I've had eight years um, doing that, learning, getting my badges, learning my trade in an academy, doing lots of co- time on the grass, coaching hours, because um, I've still got a strong passion for the game and I, I want to develop that side of it now as well. And then it got to a point where the opportunity came up to work with the men's team, which I missed. As, as good as it is to educate the young players and, and develop them, I missed the hands-on with with men and I wanted to to sort of get into a men's team so right. through through playing there was an opportunity to get onto the coaching side and, and be assistant manager so yeah I've, like I said I've thoroughly enjoyed the last few years doing that and um, hopefully it can continue and and develop into something a lot bigger who knows but I, right now I'm enjoying what I'm doing um, you see a lot of ex-players are lucky enough to drop in we talked about Craig Shaw earlier into bigger jobs as the first jobs. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Obviously, I'm, I've gone about it in a slightly different way in terms of I've worked my way up. I'm, I'm, I'm learning my trade at a, a lower level. Um, 
but enjoying it and uh, hopefully going to be successful and, and who knows where that could lead um, down the line. Uh, hopefully someone will acknowledge the job, a good job that someone's doing and, and we might get another chance, you never know. Very good. And, and you're clearly articulate and intelligent. Uh, I mean, I, I added a journalism course in 1981, which tells you how old I am. But <laughs> Don't give that away. <laughs> uh, you, you, did, you did a media studies or journalism degree, didn't you? Because obviously we, we started this programme with, with the piece that you wrote for The Independent. And you went over yeah. to Staffordshire somewhere. And quite a lot of the footballers have been through that. With Laurie Madden, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. So you, I think you get to a point in your career where you... You start thinking about things. I got, I think I hit thirty plus, and and you do have to start thinking about the next step and what you're going to do and how long is it going to go on. So I wanted to make the most of my time and obviously getting the time you get as a footballer. And I wanted to make, didn't want to waste it all. And and I got the degree behind me. Yeah, I chose the media degree. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I enjoy, I thought that might be a way to stay in football and something I'd enjoy. So I did it. I enjoyed doing it. It was tough at times, but um, I really enjoyed it. I'm glad I've got the, the degree out of it to show. It's obviously not, I've not really used the degree, uh, but, but I've got it there and I'm, I'm glad I did it when I did it. So Very good. And was Ben Burgess around doing the course at the same time or a little bit after? He, he, I think he did it before me, you know. I think he completed it before me. Because uh, I remember talking to him about it whilst I was doing it. I think he'd already finished it. He wasn't on my year, but yeah, he definitely did that, and uh, he did that before me, yeah. Because Ben became a teacher, didn't he? And he wrote yeah, a wonderful right. piece comparing and contrasting teaching and football, and how perhaps oh, yeah. towards the end of his career, and he mentioned at Knox, wasn't really enjoying it, and the, the body was telling mm. you can't really do this. And it was a brilliant yeah. piece. It was a brilliant yeah. piece that he wrote. He's a very intelligent guy and, and you, he's one that you knew was uh, going to go on and do something else really good because he, he was a bright guy. Um, trust me, there's a lot of footballers that are not bright guys. So when you <laughs> see a bright guy in football, you know, you know he's a bright guy. Um, but uh, yeah, he's, he's gone on and he's done well for himself and I think he's enjoying doing the teaching and, and the stuff that he does now. Um, Ricky, just brilliant. Just, sorry, go just on. to touch, just one more thing. Just to yeah, go on. Back. Yeah. I'm not sure if, if you're aware of it, but I actually signed Husey last year at Mickelover. Uh, he came and uh, he played for us for two or three months. So I got in touch with him and he came yeah. down and he, uh, he played some games for us and scored a few goals as well. So just, I'm not sure if you're aware of that. But yeah, I, I yeah. didn't know that. I knew he'd been at Grantham. He went been there on stations us. around the West and the East Midlands, hadn't he? Yeah, he went there after us. So when he left oh. us, he went to Grantham and that's where he finished. Because he wanted to, when I, initially when I spoke to him, that was going to be his last season no matter what, and he, he wanted to come in and he wanted to enjoy it. He wasn't enjoying football, he wanted to enjoy football again. Obviously he knew what I was about, we were good friends, so I, I knew what he'd bring. He's never going to run me channel, but leave him in the box and he's going to cause havoc and score goals. And he did that and he was unbelievable and he was brilliant. And it was great to team up with him again and work, reminisce about the old times and, and help. he helped the younger players that we had. So it was fantastic to have him on board. but. Unfortunately, again, COVID struck at the end of that year. He moved on to Grantham just before that, but he was planning on having one big, massive soiree final swan song at the end of that season. It just never happened because of COVID. I mean, how good was he? I mean, he's, he's one of the most naturally, you know, those goal poachers. You don't see so much of them, but you think back down the years of Tony Cotty, Rush... And I, I know they were at the very, very top level. But Husey had that whatever it was, didn't it? You know, in terms of the ability to finish. He just, he just, very intelligent, clever. He knew when he could get away with little fouls. He knew where the net was. You put the ball in the box. Husey was never going to go out wide, never going to take people on, never going to do all that. But he was a physical presence. He had energy to burn and he was just an act. He just knew where to be in the box. He had the instinct. They say you can't teach it, don't they? The people know where to be and know where to go. And that season, him and Ben Davis struck up some unbelievable understanding between each other because he knew exactly where he was going to put that ball at. The amount of free kicks and corners he put in and he, he just knew where to be. It was frightening. 
a lot of characters in that dressing room. I mean, you spoke about the camaraderie. I mean, who, who, who was the joker? Who were the grumpy ones? I mean, what, what, what were they like? So I, I think Ben Davis was the secret. He was like a big kid. Um, he'd be serious on the outside, but he, um, if, you, if you were getting pelted by any sort of jelly babies or anything like that, you knew he was, he was on the prowl and he was up to something. Um, listen, the obvious one, the obvious one, we all know Husey. Husey's an absolute... Sometimes takes it a little bit too far with some of the banter, but he, uh, he's, he's, he's on another level. And I remember him once bringing in this hot sauce. That yeah. <laughs> lads, which he had lads trying, and it was literally people were laying in ice baths. It were getting everywhere, and people. I think Matt Hamshaw nearly missed training because he got some. <laughs> he, he went to the toilet and got it all around his private part. I don't think he could go out and train. So he, uh, but yeah, he usually was always up to something like that. Always up to something like that. Luke um, Rogers, little in stature, but you yeah, know, you wouldn't cross yeah, him. Would no. you? <laughs> he, he was a great guy as well. Um, always, always up to something. Always, always got his head into something or up to something. But again, another one that you could rely on. You knew what you were going to get every week off the pitch for him. Um, now, we always ask. Well, we do when I remember, because I forget a few times, but unluckily for you, I have remembered. So, your six-a-side team from all the players six. you've played with at Knotts. Wow, that's tough. There you go. So you'll upset a few. That's the tough. Goalkeeper. The, oh, the goalkeeper's got to be got to be Michael. Yeah, um, that's an easy one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll go with that one. But Mike Edwards, Mike Edwards did go for Pilks ahead of Casper. Right. Obviously, I didn't play with Pilch, really, yeah. so he was a bit before before my time, so I, I, I can't say that. But Okay, so you've got five. So if we did sort of like two defenders, one middle of the park or whatever, and two up front. Do you know who I'm going to put in in my defence? Stephen Derby. What? I played with him, played with him obviously, at Knotts, met him at Knotts. Went and played with him at Bradford as well, and a very close friend. And away from everything that he's got going on, obviously very publicised. He was. How is he at the moment? He is okay. He's a, listen. It, it, it's not. It's not ideal, is it? But it, no. it, he's dealing with. He's dealing with it the best way he can, and he's he's making the most and doing what he can do. So all the thoughts are obviously with him all the time, as they always have been. But. Just as a footballer, back to football, he he was unsung, and he you knew what you were going to get from Darbs. And I don't, I'm not sure. Thinking back, that not saw the best of him. No. But when I played with him at Bradford, um, as well, he he really came into his own, and and that boy's got the heart of a lion, and he's got some ability as well. And I'd, I'd have him on my team every time, so I'm going to put him in. Okay, excellent. Um. The other one I'm going to put in is Tom between. I'm going to go John Thompson. Yeah, Tom out. Yeah. I'm going to go Tom out. Top player, top leader, um, very good captain. Enjoy playing alongside him. Everything you'd want about a, a proper winner. Another one in that team that was a winner. Knew what it would took to be, to win. Had a plenty of ability as well, um, and a good all round defender for me. Okay, so now we've got sort of three. So whether it's one, middle, two up, or however you want to do it. Um, I'm going to put I'm going to put Ben Davis in just because I think he I think he was unbelievable for what he achieved and what he did and what he brought to that team um, was 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 unbelievable. I think he was a catalyst in a lot of ways. Again, the type of character he was, the ability he had, and uh, I'm going to put him in. And I'm going to stick in there with him. I'm going to go Johnny Jackson. Johnny, yes, not mentioned Johnny. Yes, left Johnny peg. Johnny Jackson, yeah. unbelievable technical footballer. Very, very good. Again, if I'm being 100% honest, didn't the Knotts fans probably didn't see the best of him um, in training. He was, he was an unbelievable player and um, fantastic. And we're very lucky to, to, to get someone of his calibre in the team and very good technical footballer. Yeah, um, and then we'll go up front. You can't overlook him, can you? We've got to, we've got to go Husey. We've got to stick Husey in there. So uh, we'll put him in. I tell you one name. It's just something. When you're saying left-sided, um, I don't know what your recollections you would have. He's gone on to have a brilliant career. 
Matt Ritchie. Matt, Matt Ritchie. I was, yeah, I was, I was thinking. Was about he it. Like, did you did you see a real talent there when he came to us? Or yeah, of course. Again, we look and look. You got to look back and think we kickstarted his career for him because yeah. he wasn't really doing anything when he came yeah. to us. But yeah, well, technically very very good. He just. At the time, he, we always used to say he needed his own ball because he didn't know when to let go of it sometimes. He wanted to do everything. He wanted to be the one who scored or crossed the ball or did everything. And I think he's learned over the years and developed to become more of a team player. That would probably be the only downfall at, at that point for him. But he was a young lad wanting to impress. So you understand that and you know where he's coming from. But unbelievable talent and ability, which he's gone on and proved over the years, obviously. And obviously, another one you go and mention it, Tom Ince. Started, oh, really came in. Of course, yeah. Tom Ince came in. He's gone on and had a fantastic career. Uh, done so well. Came in as a young, fresh-faced lad. No one knew what to expect. Showed the raw ability, but he's he's gone and put all that on into a, a rounded performance now, and he's he's gone and shown what he can do as well. So some some fantastic players over the years have been have graced Meadow Lane and uh, probably owe a lot to their careers. Looking back, if they would be honest and say that's. That's where they got the first start. Um, just a pu purely random one. I'm just thinking a few things. Were you in the squad? I presume you were. Um, went down to Bournemouth and Sven did some deal with Peter Trembling to fly down there. Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, what was that like? Have a little jet or something? Was it as good as the Juventus one or is it a Ryanair special? No, no, yeah, yeah. it went quite on that level. But <laughs> again, we were all like, we all just was like, well, what the heck? What, what League Two team gets on a plane and flies down, flies a journey that takes three hours, four hours on a bus? By the time we got to the airport, check team got on the plane. The bus probably got there with a the kit quicker than we did, but <laughs> it, it was all. It was all another part of the experience and uh, something that we can all put in that season and say what talk about it at times like this and, and look back on. It's fantastic. But life yeah. is all about experiences and Munto was certainly an experience. Uh, Ricky, thank you ever so much indeed. Um, no problem. All the very best with the coaching career. It's interesting when we're talking about quite a lot of the Knots lads from that era. You know, Bish is now uh, on the coaching ladder uh, in the yep. Mansfield town. I think it's centre of excellence, isn't he? Um, yeah. Hughesy had a go at it, didn't he? But we all know yeah. he a bit up and down with it with Worcester. I think he was at. Yeah. Um, yeah. Himself. So uh, that's all very good and 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 and, and bodes well that um, at some point in the future, we may well have a, a, a potential management coaching pool at Knotts, you know, from which to choose. So hopefully, works. hopefully, that'd be nice. So yeah. we'll keep learning, we'll keep developing, and who knows down the line, it'd be, it would be nice to return in uh, some capacity. So uh, you just keep doors open and you keep learning and you, you see where it takes you. And hopefully one day I get to, you get to come back. Ricky, thank you very much indeed. No problem. Thank you for having me. It's been fantastic.